Hello, everyone. Welcome to a new episode. And today we have a very special guest from very special and interesting specialty. Today we welcome Dr. Ola Oye. And we are going to talk about her journey, how she matched into preventive medicine in the University of Alberta. She has an interesting story. She has an interesting background and very inspiring story. We're going to go through her phases of preparation and how did she end up in matching. Welcome, welcome, welcome. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Ruthen. Thank you. <laughs> All righty. So let's start. So tell me a bit about like your background. Where did you met school? When did you come to Canada? How was it there? Okay, great. Um, so I had my bachelor's med um, medicine um, mm. from Nigeria. Then okay. after I practiced, you know, as a family physician for about six years. Yeah. And after that, I went to... Um, United States at the University of um, South Florida, where I had my master's in public health okay. and also did certificate in epidemiology. So I worked there, um, of course, while I was studying, I gained a lot of experience because I was involved in um, a lot of research work. I was um, a research assistant, research associate. Um, I worked also as a recruiter mm -hmm. at some point. I was a principal investigator for a study that I conducted in Northern Uganda. Um, wow. so, so I did a lot of research um, over there. And um, then in 2000 and December, 2014, I came to Canada. Okay. And so while in Canada, of course I did, you know, some research and evaluation work. I decided some for University of Calgary, like a contract job then also did evaluation um, for the nursing school at the Red Deer University. Um, and also, you know, of course I did a particular year, then they called me back yeah. the following year because they so, liked my- So you came here in 2014, right? Yeah, December, 2014. So I'll just say, let's say January, 2015, basically. Okay, so let's start at December, 2014. Right. When did you decide like, yes, I want to go into residency and I want to write exams. Like, tell me about this decision. Okay, yeah, so when I got in, um, yeah. I didn't make that decision to um, go into residency um, until about a year after. Wow. Um, that I got in, yeah. So the, let's say about 2015, thereabouts. So that was when the journey started. Okay. You know, I did the NCEE. After a while, they said, no, you can't use that anymore. Then, yeah, exactly. Canceled. Then I did QE1. Then of, of, I did my NAC and everything. So this took me some years because I didn't pass um, like my QE1 in the first sitting until the second sitting. That was when I passed it. Um, so it took me a couple of years um, to get all this done. So I did my NAC um, for the first time last year. And right. um, yeah, so, and applied for residency. But prior to then, I was still working in, you know, like public health related work. Okay, so, so you still had some work related to medicine? Yes, I still had some work related to medicine. Okay, right. so you wrote the EE, the NAC <laughs> OSCE, and the yeah. QE1. Right. Okay, um, can you like tell us a bit about like what resources did you use uh, to prepare for those? Okay, well, I would say um, for my QE1, I used, um, of course, Toronto Notes. I used... Um, master the boards. Um, then I also used, you know, the Canada Q Bank, the um, MCC Bank, the Question Bank, and then also U World. Then, okay. of course, um, I attended some boot camp classes too, and also some classes with um, AMCA. Mm -hmm. And so for my NAC, solely it was AMCA that I, you know, I used AMCA and AIMGA, um, you know, because I'm a member of the um, Inga, I hope you know what Inga is, right? The Alberta no, International, actually, okay, let's Alberta explain International Medical Graduate Association. You know, because I live in Alberta. Alberta International Medical Graduate Association. Oh, okay. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. So I live in Alberta. So they also provide resources for us as well, and also provide resources for even people outside Alberta as well. So yeah, so but solely AMCA, I'd say, and Dr. Basil um, classes. Yeah, so those are the resources I actually used for in preparation. Okay. Can, can you tell me about this association? I've never heard about them, like Alberta Medical Association? Yeah, Alberta International Medical Graduate Association. It's government funded. Um, so, okay. Have, yeah, it's Alberta government funded. I think it was primarily meant for people, for doctors that are resident in Alberta. 
Oh, okay. And I think maybe they got it expanded right now. So they kind of provide resources um, for people even outside um, Alberta. So um, resources like, for example, even if you're trying to, um, they sometimes organize like um, symposiums, you know, training, mm -hmm. they bring in people to speak, to talk about their journey, um, to also do different types of training um, as well. And um, I would say just a variety of a variety of resources, you know, that they provide there as well. So it's wow, it's that's great. I never heard about that. Actually, like this is really good for people who are living in Alberta. Um, yeah. So it's going to be really good for them. Okay, so we talked about the exams. Um, also, like you arrived like in 2014 until 2021, and you work mainly in the healthcare, right? Yeah. Tell me a bit about it, like. What type of work did you do for people who are like international medical graduates and they are here? This could be beneficial. Like, what can I do as an international medical graduate in Canada? Something related to medicine, something related to healthcare. I would love to grab your mind. All right, absolutely. So um, the type of work I did, you know, I mentioned I was into research and you know um, earlier on, and also um, I also worked with you know Alzheimer's Society at some point, mm -hmm. and so I was like first link. They call it my position was first link intake coordinator. So people that are di diagnosed with dementia, they're mm -hmm. referred to us. So we kind of provide services. I, I would educate families and caregivers about dementia. I'll go into communities to do presentations and you know link them to resources in the community. And meanwhile, also I was still doing like a research by the side evaluation, like I mentioned, you know, for the Red Deer Polytechnic University. And also um, I my current job right now is um, a data analyst. I'm a senior analyst at Alberta Health Services. Um, so what I do is basically I do analyze data. I do literature review. I do everything related to research evaluation and all, 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 all the likes and epidemiology related work. Um, so that's what I really do now. So I think that was also very helpful um, because I have a, a wealth of experience in, um, in research and evaluation. Wow, wow. And if you don't mind, like we can touch a bit on this. So like you were work, work, working in something that's related to healthcare, right. you did not like, you gained experience, you learned from it. And right. I'm sure that supported you financially to write the exams and to go through all the exams because like those are expensive, eh? Right, exactly. So that was really, I, if I didn't have the job, I don't know how I'd have done those exams, honestly. <laughs> Because they were really like, yeah, they actually helped him to write the exam. So that's how I was able to fund my exams by myself. So, yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Alrighty. So it looks like you covered the research part, but one of the components of the CARMS is like people need uh, some like hands-on experience, clinical experience, someone to like write through letters of reference. Mm -hmm. um, did you do any observerships or elective? How was it? Oh, yeah. So I did observership. Mm -hmm. um, so the observation that I got was like an hour drive away from where I live. So it's more like technically two hours back and forth. Um, so, and I did that, you know, continuously for like over a year, I would say, because, yeah. Um, yeah, so I think that that was really helpful. So I got recommendation letter um, from there as well. Right. Sure. Wow. And like, how did you secure the observership? Like, this is something lots of IMGs struggle with. Like, how was it? Like, can you tell me about the process? Okay. Well, so there's um, a, an association of medical doctors from Nigeria. Um, okay. In, in, I was living in Red Deer before I moved to Calgary. Um, so I was part of the association, although I wasn't, you know, practicing as a doctor, but I'm kind of part of them. And so I, I talked to one of the coordinators about my intention to do observership. And so he linked me up with the person um, who was my supervisor during the observership. So that was how I got the observership position. Gotcha. And if you don't mind asking you, like, what was the observership and like? Yeah, so it was, um, it was observership at the hospital. So it was mm -hmm. basically emergency cases that I was seeing. So how would kind of, you know, take history, do examination. I mean, he allowed me to do all that. And also- um, Supervision you know, um, for the patient as well. So, yeah, so which also really helped um, okay. during my NAC exam, for sure. Yeah, for sure. I, I completely agree with you. Like, I think the NAC exam, as like I mentioned previously in my videos, like it's mainly about the practice, practice, practice. Absolutely. Practice. Yeah. 
Okay. And was this like your only observership or did you do other observerships as well? No, that was the only observership. Um, yeah, of course, even getting to do that was, it wasn't so easy for me, you know, combining that with my work, also studying and also I only stuck to one. Yeah, that yeah. was the only Yeah, I agree with you. Um, like getting an observership is not easy, but it is doable. Um, okay, so we did the observerships, we did the exam, and it looks like you covered also like the research part. Mm -hmm. Other parts is like, I think you touched a bit on it. Like you did some extracurricular activities, right? Like you did some volunteering and some work in the community. Mm -hmm. And I think you mentioned the Alzheimer Society. So like, if you can tell like people who are listening more about it, that's okay. Uh, well, I would say volunteer for me. Um, some of the things I did basically, like I'm a musician as well. Like I think music I, record, I record music I record albums and stuff and I also sing in the community so um I'm quite engaged in my community that way so I sing at events you know um, wow. at, you know at libraries they call me for stuff museums and stuff like that so international settings different settings so I kind of give back to the community that way and um yeah, I, I'm, I'm kind of I'm connected to my community and also trying to, I'd also got to know my community more when I, I worked with the Alzheimer's Society because I was actually involved in linking people to the resources in the community. So I was also able to build that network um, in the community. Oh, good for you. Yeah. Nice. Okay. So just for people who are listening, I just want to emphasize one point that this is your first time you applied to residency and you got in from the first time, right? Right. Okay. All righty. And did you write any of the like United States lasting exams or like, was it only like uh, exams related to Canada or like, did you apply? Did you think about applying to the U S or no? No, I didn't do any. I've not done any U S exams at all. Only Canadian exams. Only Canadian exams. Okay. Um, and uh, so you applied to residency and now you got the interviews. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me a bit about like this experience? How was like, uh, where did you apply? What factors do you think about when you were applying? Did you apply only to one specialty or multiple specialties? Like, how was it, if that's okay with you to give this information for the people who are listening? Oh, sure, absolutely. Um, so I applied only to two um, disciplines and that's family medicine and um, public health preventive medicine. And I, I, I mean, either or any of, any of the two would have just been fine for me. I didn't mind I, because I chose family medicine because I looked at the factor that I have been so involved in public health already. Um, so um, just also having that component of it won't be a bad idea. Like I love people. I love to interact with people and, um, you know, meet people's needs that way. Um, and also still the public health aspects, I didn't mind either one. So, uh, but I really love public health because I've, been very involved in public health for a very long time so it's something that it's really also very my, my comfort zone too as well so I applied to both and luckily I got um you know public health preventive medicine and I also like the fact that um, for public health preventive medicine it's something that it, the program is very flexible you can tailor it to what exactly you want to be you want it to be like for your career and um, it's flexible if you still want to have some you know clinical component later on you can have an add-on and all those stuff so it's kind of flexible um, which I really admire and also the quality of life is great as well so I you know so those are the factors I, I actually um, thought about when I was applying for both um, both the disciplines yeah so yeah okay and like do you have any tips and tricks for people who are like preparing for interviews um, like, was it MMI? Was it traditional? How did you prepare for it? Okay, yeah. So, oh, yeah. P preparation, I think, for me, is just like you're doing NAC. And you have to just practice. You have to practice for interviews. You can't just assume, oh, everything's... Because sometimes you think you know it, but you don't know what to say. Or if you, even if you know it, your answers will not get so organized unless you practice real well. So you have to practice to the extent that when someone wakes you up, right away, you, you can just say it spontaneously without thinking, you know, and yes, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's so, you know, it can be boring, it can be like, oh, you're doing the same thing over and over again, you know, you can even spend maybe two, three hours on a question, it's okay, just make sure you get it right, and it becomes really smooth for you, and when you go, and also when you prepare, I feel that, you know, when you get to the, um, 
for, when you get in for the interview, you are even more confident. Even if you don't know the question they are asking you, there's that confidence because you've prepared already. So something, you'd, you'd be able to say at least something um, to that. And also, I think another thing I'd say is, um, you know, when one goes for the interview, um, you should just be relaxed. They're human beings like you, right? So just take it like that, that's, you know, nobody's going to eat you up. <laughs> yes, <exactly. laughs> exactly. You know, and if you don't remember something, it's okay for you to say, um, please hold on. Can you give me some time to get my thought together? Um, I think I did that one time during my interview and I, I was able to get the answer eventually. You know, at least I think I was able to answer the question. So it's okay for you to take your time um, if you don't actually know the answer right away. And so um, basically, I, because I think a lot of times, um, anxiety is just enough to ruin your interview. I think that's the most, but if you can overcome that anxiety and one of the major ways by overcoming the anxiety is actually doing that practice and just practice and practice and practice. I practice with different people and mm -hmm. I practice with residents, um, you know, then I had, you know, also people, you know, of course, before the interview, I had people look over my resumes, people that I felt, you know, some residents look over my resumes, my personal statement and all. Then for the interviews too, I did the same practice with colleagues, practice with, um, you know, residents and whatever feedback you get, don't take it like, oh, this person doesn't like me, go back, work on it and try it again. And if you can even go to the same person that, you know, gave you that feedback at first to find out whether you've improved the better, so you know whether you're, you know, you're, you're getting better at it, but don't give up most importantly. And um, yeah, just, just um, give it all it takes when you get that interview, just try and reflect back on how far you've gone, how, how, what, what you went through before you got to that point, you know, and just have it in your mind, this is the last lap. So let me give it the best um, that I need to give it to get in. So that's so important for sure. Yeah, I would just like emphasize on that. I think like um, recently I've been helping people with their interviews. Uh, like, mm -hmm. I think you said one of the most important things that you should treat the interview as you treat the OSCE exam. You have to right. practice, you have to write down your question, your answers, and you have to think about it previously. And when you have like a script for like two to three pages about like, what are the important things that you want to highlight, no matter what they ask you, like you can navigate your answer, you can come up with, and answer based on what they ask you, but like you can bring up different experiences and like combine them together and come up with a different answer specifically tailored to what you're being asked. So I completely agree with you. Yes. So that's, I think, very, very, very important. And you mentioned that you have a family and you have kids and like many international maker graduates and they come in, they come into families. For me, like I'm afraid about even thinking about it. So how, how can the family help you? How are you able to manage getting into residency and taking care of your family. Yeah, I would say, you know, I, I think that I was also saying that, that, you know, for me, I don't think I would even be able to get here without my family because for me, family is a very strong support for me. I drew my strength from, of course, God and family. Um, so um, it's so important for me. And I also have a supportive husband, supportive kids. So it's, it's made the journey, you know, kind of a bit, you know, better in a way <laughs> <It's> easier <laughs> yeah <laughs> so yeah so yeah sure i have a two I, I have two kids two sons um one is 14 and the other is four year old boy so both of them are boys and yeah i'm i'm glad i have them and as a, I'm wow wow inspiring inspiring okay um is there any part of your experience that you want to highlight you feel we did we did not cover um well, I think generally, I think we kind of, you know, um, yeah, covered most of it all, I, I would say. I think we talked about it. I mean, an overview. <laughs> of course, we didn't talk about everything. but And also, yeah, another thing I'd like to say also is, you know, volunteering. Because um, I remember um, when I was in the U.S., I did volunteer, um, you know, on a, in, at Moffitt Cancer Center. Mm -hmm. and, the center for about six months and I was not paid. And I would say that most of the, you know, skills that I got um, for research analytical skills I got from there. Although then some people felt like, how would you do volunteer work without being paid? Like how would you work for that long without being paid? So I, would, I just want to encourage people that, you know, volunteer is really good. Don't, um, 
when you take up a volunteer work, do it as if you're being paid, you know, because you never know um, how helpful that will be for you in the future. You don't know whether you're going to need even reference letters from these places. So it's so important that, you know, you take your volunteer um, positions um, very seriously and um, work hard and build very good relationships with people because it goes a long way eventually um, to help even your application because I can for sure say my own recommendations letters were very strong. So and if you have um, very strong recommendation letters, that's that could be really very helpful on the heart. Okay. Very, very true, very true. I like I one hundred percent agree with that. Yeah. Any last tips, any last advice, any last words uh, for people who haven't crossed the bridge yet, what would you say to them? Honestly, I would say that, you know, they shouldn't give up, especially if you've written all your exams, you're closer to the end than the beginning. Um, just keep at it, don't give up. And this is, these are the same words that I was told that anytime I reflected on those words, it, I was energized to keep moving, you know, so please don't give up, keep at it. Someday, just believe there's a position somewhere for you and the time will definitely come if you don't give up. Amazing, amazing, amazing. Well, I just want to say thank you so much for sharing this and uh, for every IMG who managed to cross the bridge, please feel free like to email me if you want to share your story. Like stories like this is what help us to keep going and keep pushing forward and not wasting the years of like studying and learning. Thank you so much. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you for doing this after a long day at work. You just came home. You never had lunch. And <laughs> doing this for people out there. Thank you so much. <laughs> and thank you for all you do as well. Thank you. You're doing a great job. And I really appreciate that. <laughs>